What's up everybody, Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today I want to talk to you guys about housing a newborn baby boa constrictor. A lot of these tips can be applied to any species of snake, but what I want to make this focused on are boa constrictors since that's what I produce the most of, and I get a lot of questions from my customers saying, hey Jason, how do you recommend me set this baby up? So in this video, I'm going to run through the things that I think you need, the, the way it should be, the bonuses that you can add, and, and uh, we can go from there. So let's dive right into it. When I tell you to set up a baby boa constrictor, if you're purchasing it from me, uh, I don't put a limit on cage size. So a lot of people will ask me, is there a limit on cage size? Do I need to have a small cage and upgrade often? That's really your personal preference. You can get this massive enclosure or you can have this tiny little enclosure. But I do wanna show you how I house things. I like to keep things simple and clean. That's mainly part of because I'm breeding things. So a lot of people argue that that's the bare minimum. I've used more than the bare minimum before. It's uh, in my opinion, this is how my boa constrictors tend to thrive and they really do well. When I start doing all these extra things that I'm gonna discuss in the video, it's just another factor that you need to worry about. And if I had a handful of snakes, you know, five snakes, I would probably have a much more elaborate setup in these really cool cages. But because I have hundreds of snakes I need to care for and manage, everything needs to be clean and sterile and, and it needs to have a condition so that the snake can thrive and be healthy and happy when it gets to you guys. So first thing we're gonna need, one is you need heat. Now, heat is the most important factor for snakes in general. They're cold-blooded. Too hot, you're gonna kill them. Too cold, they're gonna get sick and you're probably gonna kill them. So heat really is the most important factor. Now, depending on the type of enclosure that you guys have, and I did a whole video on enclosure types, but uh, this can kind of be universal and I'm gonna try to spread it over everything. So if you have like a, a wooden enclosure or a glass terrarium or a PVC enclosure, you can use a combination of maybe some lights or some under tank heat pads or some radiant heat panels. Now, depending on what you have, obviously if you have like an aquarium type enclosure, uh, you can either use like an under tank heat pad or a heat bulb on the top or a ceramic heat emitter. Those all work really well. Uh, if you have a wooden enclosure, depending on how it's set up, if you don't want to ever have a bulb exposed in the enclosure, and a lot of the times the wood is going to be too thick for it to be uh, for it to use a heat pad underneath, so those might not be options for you. But you need to worry about heat. So question one: What type of enclosure are you going to use? I'm going to assume for the purpose of this video, most people, newer beginner snakes, are going to be using uh, a glass aquarium. So. Let's kind of move forward with that assumption. Now, a glass aquarium, you depending on your room temperature, I've had people tell me, hey, I have it all set up, but I can't get my temperatures up to where they need to be. That's usually because one, glass is not a good insulator, or, and two, your room is too cold overall. So some of you guys might have a reptile room like me that's already 80 degrees and you put an under tank heat pad in there, you give them a hot spot, the ambient's gonna be 80 degrees and you're in fantastic shape. But many of you are gonna have this in your bedroom or your living room or some other living space where it, you don't want it at 80 degrees or it's not gonna be 80 degrees all the time. So what I usually recommend to people is that they use under tank heat pads. Uh, Zuben makes them. You can use flex watt heat tape and, and all these really good ways of heating from below. Uh, if that doesn't work because your room is too cold, you may need to also use an overhead source, something like a ceramic heat emitter that doesn't give off light all the time. So you could use a bulb, but when you turn that off at night, your temperatures are gonna drop. That might be fine depending on where you are and where you live, but uh, sometimes it's gonna drop too low and you're gonna have to use a ceramic heat emitter all the time. Those day night bulbs or the night bulbs, the ones that are red or blue, uh, I'm not a fan of them. I personally think that any type of light can impact the snake, whether it be infrared or ultraviolet. I'm not sure what those, uh, those blue bulbs are. Maybe they're just painted blue, but um, any type of those bulbs, I, I don't recommend them. I would always prefer a ceramic heat emitter over that. So I would say, in addition to that, I always usually recommend people start with a smaller enclosure, at least newer keepers, mainly because it's easier to control those little microclimates. If you go buy this gigantic six by three enclosure, that's great, your snake's gonna be able to grow into it. Yes, they can live in there perfectly fine without, with limited stress, 
but you're going to have a difficult time controlling temperatures. And that's why I usually say, well, start with like a 20 gallon long if you're gonna go for an aquarium. Something like that size. That way, if it's too small, you're gonna have a hard time getting those climate variations because it's just gonna be super heated in every spot. If it's too large and you're not experienced with it, you're gonna have a hard time getting those temperatures to where they need to be. So start with something simple. Baby boa constrictor, put them in like a 20 gallon long, under tank heat pad and a little light on top. Now, the next piece of all this is gonna be humidity. Humidity is a very important factor for snakes in general. Uh, you'll notice that they're not shedding properly. Humidity is gonna be controlled by a factor of the substrate you're gonna use inside there and also the amount of ventilation. So it's kind of simple is, uh, think of a desert, a, 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 a an open, hot, windy environment is gonna reduce your humidity. Then you have like a tropical island where you're gonna have this wet, uh, sometimes windy, but um, most of the time it's gonna be adequate coverage. There's gonna be rainforests and trees and things around. So it's gonna be reducing the wind and that's gonna be boosting your humidity. You might have basins where these animals are living, Amazon basin, which is where a lot of these kind of boa constrictors are living in. Um, but along the coastlines, it's gonna be more dry and arid. So you, uh, you have to consider that is that where, how am I gonna keep my humidity in? Most of the time, the aquarium style enclosures, the biggest downfall of them isn't the insulation factor, it is that you have too much ventilation on top. Things like corn snakes that can live in this 30 to 50% humidity, fantastic for them. But uh, things like boa constrictors where you need that 50 to 80%, you know, 60 to 75% humidity, that airflow is just gonna be too great. So what I usually recommend people do is either they take some like duct tape, very carefully, you don't want the duct tape peeling off and doing it on the underside of the screen, taping it up and then taping it over. Uh, you need to be careful with if you're gonna use duct tape because the snake could peel it off and get stuck to it and that's the last thing you want. Um, or you can just use like a piece of plexiglass, which works fantastic. You can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or, or even just a glass store, measure out the dimension you have, and then put a piece of glass over the top of it. Glass, plexiglass, something like that, over the top so it reduces the amount of ventilation. Now with that, a lot of people will do that and say, hey, my humidity is still terrible. They send me a picture of their enclosure and they got about a centimeter of bedding in there. Humidity, you need to have deeper substrate in order to keep it up. An occasional spray will work, but if you don't have thick uh, bedding or substrate, or you're using something drier like an aspen or a newspaper, then you're gonna wanna spray it down uh, very frequently. You can get away with this working much better if you use a thicker substrate and you use something like a cypress bark. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna throw this out there is that uh, this channel is now gonna be sponsored by Freedom Breeder and I requested that I get some of their cocoa block. I think it looks like a really promising substrate but before I 100% recommend it to you guys, I wanna try it and I wanna make sure it's something that I can get behind. So I'm gonna just throw it out there that I am going to be uh, getting some cocoa block. I'm gonna try that. It looks like everything that I like about cypress mulch, but in a more storable form and also in something that's maybe a little bit cleaner and, and less uh, less messy because the, the, the cypress I was using had all these varied chunks and it got kind of really dusty. So I'm hoping I once I try this cocoa block, I'm gonna do a whole review for you guys and let you know is this a go or no go. Uh, but this channel is now sponsored by Freedom Breeder, which I totally appreciate. Um, I have all Freedom Breeder racks and I'm going to be swapping them all out. So I'll get into more on that in another video, but I just thought about it as we're talking about substrate. So substrate, you're going to want this kind of damp substrate, but you don't want it wet. There's a very big difference between wet and damp and humid and wet. When you spray down a enclosure, you're making it wet. When you reduce the amount of ventilation, that wetness is in a, in a warm environment is gonna evaporate and make it humid. So when people say, oh, I spray it three times a day, you're not making it humid, you're making it wet. What you need to do is make it humid. That's good on their respiratory tract, that's good on their shedding cycle, and that's where you really see the benefits, not from spraying it. So when you use a substrate that is thick, like that cocoa block or like a cypress mulch, um, that is where you're gonna start to see the benefits. But you wanna put in you know, an inch and a half, two inches, depending on how big of an enclosure, obviously. Uh, and that's what you're gonna get, is usually the surface will dry out, but deep down below, that's where you're gonna have the humidity coming from. 
So wanna throw that out there. And I am gonna show some babies and show kind of my general setup. Uh, again, my room is like already 50 to 75% humidity all the time. So I'm able to get away with using Aspen. But I do that because I have cement floors and I will literally spray my floors down with water to boost the humidity. What I want to be able to do is not spray my floors down and have the enclosures have the humidity. That way it's it's kind of more, more for what the snake is going to do and it'll be less work for me to spray my floors down every day. Uh, again, heat, humidity, sealed off environment, my whole room humidity goes up. But I want to keep it more in the cages and less in my house. So with that said, the next piece we need to worry about with, with setting up a bow constrictor is shelter. Uh, any snake is going to need shelter. The nice part about bedding is that they can burrow and feel very safe in the burrow environment. Now, this is where I see a lot of people go wrong, is when they get a hide box, they say, oh, I'm going to get a hide. They go to the pet store and they buy this giant mound for this little snake that's like the size of my fist or smaller, and then they're buying this hide that's like 10 times the size of it. The purpose of a hide is the snake needs to feel tight and secure. Now, yes, some of the hides have these kind of multi layers and the snake can curl up in the back corner and, and stuff itself into the corner and feel secure. That especially works well if you have bedding and it can burrow down a little bit underneath it. But when I tell people get a hide, I'm talking like tiny, something that like, like a, a coconut cut in half is a great hide, especially if you get, uh, you know, some of the bedding, like I've mentioned, they can burrow down. Another really good hide is just a flat rock. Go to Home Depot, get a piece of slate. Don't go to the pet store to buy this stuff. The pet store has these things that look fancy, but they don't work how we need them to work. As reptile keepers, we need stuff that works, not stuff that looks nice. If you can get something that works and looks nice, that's a total bonus. But uh, you definitely want something that works over something that just looks nice. So I tell people, go get a flat piece of slate. Uh, go get a piece of cork bark, lay that down then the snake will go under, but you need substrate with this. They'll go under, they'll burrow underneath, and they'll make this little cave for themselves, and they'll feel super secure in that. And that's where they're gonna thrive. Usually when people say their snake's not eating, one, it's because they're, not, they're holding them too much, or two, it's because their cage is off. Um, a snake will always eat if things are on point, if it's not sick. So those are usually what's wrong is, I'll, they'll send me a picture of their enclosure. They have like a, a, a reptile carpet down, which is okay, but, but it's not where, it's kind of like the equivalent of newspaper, but it can harbor more bacteria. Um, and I always say, well, change it over to something like that cocoa chip or the cocoa block and, or a substrate like a cypress mulch or even an aspen, but your aspen, when you get to the higher humidity, is going to mold a lot. And then give it a flat hide. Give it go go get a piece of slate. I cannot stress this enough. Slate works fantastic as hides because it's heavy. But you want to make sure you have enough substrate. And a lot of the times, what I'll do is I'll take the substrate, you know, a couple inches of substrate, and I'll make a little divot in it, and I'll make kind of like a tunnel. Then I'll put the rock right on top of it. That way, the animal goes into the tunnel. It feels super secure under there. So these are all really great things you can do that I almost guarantee you your snake is going to eat once you fix these things. Now you don't need to get this massive piece of slate. It's like a little rock, you know, depending on the size of your snake. So that's kind of like the last piece that I think is needed. And then water. Water's a given. These snakes always need water. So you need to give them access to fresh, clean water. Uh, I use tap water. My tap water is good. Depending on where you live in the country, you may have, uh, have high chemicals in there, or you may have some hard water, and you might need to treat it with something. But where I live, I just use regular tap water. I have fantastic tap water. Uh, well water can be really good, but you need to just know the water that you have available. Um, if you don't have good water around, uh, if you can't just turn on the tap and drink it yourself, then maybe you want to get some, some uh, filtration system, you know, get one of those Brita filters or whatever it may be. But uh, you know your tap water situation better than I do, so I don't want to recommend a specific water source, but I usually say... If I can drink it, they're gonna drink it. So I drink my tap water, my snakes drink my tap water. Now, if you have things like amphibians, this can matter a little bit more, in my opinion. I've never had an issue with snakes drinking the water that I drink, so that's how I continue to do it. Now, let's get into a couple snakes. I keep things, again, very, very simple. Usually what these animals will do is I have a basic enclosure because these freedom breeder racks here, uh, which I really enjoy, but 
Time to upgrade, so again, Freedom Breeder, thank you. We're upgrading all these old Freedom Breeder racks and going into some new Freedom Breeder racks that I cannot wait for. Um, I'm really excited. These guys behind me are like 20 years old. It's time to move them out. Somebody else will enjoy them, kick them off in their Freedom Breeder adventure. Then when it's time for them to move on, somebody will buy them and buy some new stuff. But uh, I, I, and again, I don't mean to, to make this a Freedom Breeder ad, but I love these cages for the reasons that I'm gonna go into as well is the cages themselves act almost like a hide. So occasionally I'll have some sensitive animals and I'll put some cork bark and things like that in there. I'll put a couple pieces of slate so they have a piece to go under. Um, I can't, again, I can't stress slate enough. It's a fantastic product and it's cheap. I can get a, a whole bunch of this stuff or a single piece if I have one reptile for like a dollar at Home Depot. And, and I can hit it with a hammer and break it up into the pieces that I need. Then I can put it in all the cages and it just works really well. So these cages behind me, uh, I'll just pull out this guy as an example. So they usually, how these Freedom Breeder racks work and how most racks work in general is they have a belly heat source in the back. You can see the snakes here. It was in this back corner and it's kind of this low back corner tight. A lot of the times I have a simple water bowl. And they'll, they'll actually burrow underneath their water bowl as kind of a hide. Or again, I'll put a little piece of slate in there. They'll be borrowed under that and it works really great. I can put the water bowl in the middle and put a piece of slate on both sides. But this is a, a simple animal. I actually just fed this guy, so I'm gonna put him back and I don't want to, uh, don't want to bother him, but I'll pull out a different one for you. Uh, this guy did get fed, but it was, uh, it was over the weekend here. So you can see they're, they're mainly in the back on their heat. And um, the, you know, this is little little hypo blood boa that I'm gonna hold back and raise. I'll just show him off for a minute. I know how you guys like seeing that. So um, yeah, really cool little animal here. But uh, little hypo blood, uh, and again, their enclosure is very very simple. I have some some aspen bedding, which I do plan to change over to that cocoa block once I get it in. I should hopefully have that next week, and I am looking forward to telling you guys about it. Um, I don't want to endorse something or tell you to go buy it until I've tried it myself. If I do like it, I'm going to buy like a pallet of this stuff because it, it's time to do it. It's time to do it up right in here with the new racks and the new cocoa block. I'm going to just put it in everything and see how it works. Uh, I've heard great things about it. So what I wanted to show you with that is because it's a smaller, um, more lower lying enclosure, what I would rather do is have the animal feel super safe and secure in its enclosure, and then when it comes out, get used to me. And its interaction and, and what people might call uh, enrichment would be the time that it comes out, it can enjoy with me. And I've stressed that in my handling and taming videos is that if these animals can interact with us, have that be their, their enrichment. Uh, now you can do other things you can put if you have these taller enclosures put branches put logs put all this other cool stuff in there but remember anything you put in there needs to be disinfected so make sure whatever you put in can be easily disinfected regularly um, i do want to talk about if you have this 20 gallon enclosure again uh, go out to the woods now depending on where you live let's say i'm going to use the united states but most parts of the world you can go out to the woods and get a fantastic branch um, you don't need to treat it you don't need to bake it you don't need to do anything crazy with it go to the woods get a branch get a log get something cool that you look you like the shape of um, you know go to the tree in your front yard that needs to be trimmed and cut a branch off and that's that that can be like this little jungle gym to give this animal some exercise if you want to sprite if you want to spice up their enclosure a little bit there are very few parasites at least in north america in the in the general vicinity you know be careful of ticks and things like that but just do a little inspection of the branch there's going to be very little in that in that piece of wood that's going to be harm, harmful to your animal. So I'm a big advocate of just going out and using what's free as opposed to paying $30 from whatever it was from the pet store. You can do other cool things. You can take a bin of water and bleach, put some water, put some bleach, soak it in there for like a week. And, um, and it, it gives us this really cool, almost driftwood look to it, which I enjoy. And if you're worried about parasites, then it can kind of take the parasite piece out of it. So there's all different really cool things that we can do to enrich these cages if you want to do that. But I, I like to promote a simple way of keeping because the more you enrich these environments, the more error there is to go wrong or the more room there is for error is if you don't disinfect that fake plant, if you don't disinfect that water bowl, if you have to take all this out and clean it and then you have to put it all back, can you clean what you put back? 
that's going to harbor bacteria. And the bacteria in the long run may get your snake sick, especially if you have uh, a more humid environment or your conditions start to fluctuate or go off. You might be fantastic for six months, but then all of a sudden, you skip on, on cleaning the branch. You skip on cleaning this or cleaning that, or this is in the way and you get a little lazy and you just scoop out the, the, you know, the dirty substrate in the corner and it slowly starts to harbor bacteria that a year from now causes your snake to get sick. So I always promote kind of a more simplistic approach, meeting their needs of food, water, shelter, humidity, and you guys should be in good shape. So. I think this answered the videos of how to set up a baby boa. I'm going to recap real quickly right now is if I, if you're purchasing it from me and you have kind of no experience, go to the pet store, get yourself a 20 gallon long aquarium. It's probably, I don't know, I think it's like two feet by, by one foot wide. It's going to last your snake about a year, year and a half, depending on the sex, depending on whether, uh, you know, how often you're feeding and the, and the specific growth weight of that animal. It's going to last about a year to a year and a half. Get yourself a piece of slate from Home Depot. Go get yourself some, some uh, like a, a bark mulch type of substrate. I'll get back to you on the coca block whether you should get it or not. My general thought is yes, because I'm buying a ton for myself. But again, I want to try it before I tell you guys to go buy it. Um, get yourself uh, a couple pieces of slate. Get an under tank heat pad under there, maybe a thermostat, which I've made a thermostat video. Uh, most of the store-bought heat mats you have, they already have a limiter on them of how hot they can get, but it still never hurts to go get another thermostat or one of those rheostats just to make sure you're not going to cook the snake. This is especially important if you're using a flat substrate or if you're using the flat rock over substrate as a hide, is you want to make sure that you're controlling that temperature, especially in an aquarium. They're going to go down and you might zap that surface and it might say 80 degrees, but that actual hot spot, that actual heat tape that you're putting underneath it might be 110. You don't want to cook your snake. So get a little thermostat. Inkbird thermostats are cheap enough. Uh, they're like 35 bucks for the cheap ones, 50 bucks for the ones with the Wi-Fi. I think I use the the 308 Inkbird ITC 308. Um, I'm gonna have a couple of those. They're probably upstairs. I just ordered them off Amazon because I wanted a few more just as backups. I replaced a couple of my old ones. So uh, I'm not sponsored by them. I just really like it. Uh, so I would recommend getting yourself a thermostat. Get yourself, depending on your room condition, a, uh, a dome light. Don't go buy the ones at the pet store. Go to Home Depot. Get the one that's like eight bucks. It's got a ceramic top to it and, and you can put um, one of those ceramic heat emitters. You may need to buy that from the pet store. Uh, they can be kind of pricey, but check around. So 20 gallon aquarium, under tank heat mat, couple pieces of slate, water bowl right in the middle. Uh, get yourself a light. Uh, put that on one end of the enclosure. Do not put it in the middle. Heat will convect up like this if you do that. Uh, I would put it all on the hot end. That way it goes in a circle and uh, that works out very well. Then get yourself a piece of plexiglass or you can just tape up the top. That way it holds in the humidity. Just put enough where the light is there and a little bit of ventilation and try it out. You can always put more, but uh, those are the perfect things. And the last thing I want to recommend is a temperature gun. You can also get those at Home Depot. They're like 10 to 20 bucks at Home Depot, or you can get them at most pet stores. They're like these little black things, and they work okay. It's got a little laser pointer. You zap the heat, and um, it tells you the temperature. So important. Probably my most used piece of equipment that I could possibly get is that. Um, all the other stuff you may want to get are little snake tongs. So uh, I don't have any with me right this second, but uh, little snake tongs to feed. That way you can get your frozen thawed mice and you can dangle it in front. When you're taking, you don't want to use your hand. Uh, you can eventually use your hand or, or you can start using your hand, you know, grab it by the tail. But um, your hand is almost always going to be hotter than the rodent and that itself can, can, can scare them. So I recommend getting the tongs. You can hold it by the tail. I get some pretty long ones, mainly because I can feed different size rodents with that. I can feed my adult bows with the longer, the 18 inch tongs, or I can feed the babies, but mainly so that my hand is not in the view of the rodent that I'm doing. So recommend the tongs. And if you want to get a snake hook, just because they're kind of cool, so kind of like a cool per first thing to have, um, I do. I will make another video just on how to use the snake hook. Do not misuse a snake hook. You will harm your animal. Uh, you can break their ribs. Maybe not babies, but with some of the older animals, you, if you use a snake hook wrong, uh, you could hurt them. So I would say snake hook, save that as like another thing to get. But uh, that's a cool thing to get like later on down the line, because again, they're always kind of cool things to get. 
So hopefully you guys appreciate this video. Please like it, subscribe it, uh, share it if you find it worthy. And I really appreciate you guys watching. Until next week, let's keep it moving. Thanks, guys.